the peace of Christ be with you, and welcome to our service here at Bridgeview today. We are happy to be here on this holiday weekend, and I hope you had the opportunity. Hope you had the opportunity to celebrate yesterday, and we're glad that you're here today. Um, we also want to welcome those who are worshiping my uh, Facebook Live now and also later when, when they watch the recording. Uh, I know all of us are hoping to climb out of these COVID restrictions very soon, but in the meantime, we appreciate very much your patience and your faithfulness uh, during this difficult time. And um, I also want to remind you that we do have a Sunday school class on Zoom after this service today, about 1145. If you don't want to mess with Zoom, but you don't mind sticking around here, I, I'll be out in the lobby is where I sit in front of my computer, and we can put chairs out there for those who'd like to stay to be a part of that Sunday school if you'd like to. Today we're going to talk about uh, some new trends in theology and the way we talk about God and the Bible. Next Sunday, the plan is that we will start a book, uh, Adam Hamilton's book, Unafraid, where he looks at different fears and how the Bible and our faith speaks to those. There is a book that you can get, but it's not necessary. Uh, we'll be using that as our, as our guide. Well, we still are not able to sing because of the uh, restrictions, and nor are we able to have the children come forward for the children's moment. But I do invite you to uh, join in saying the Lord's Prayer and responses to the prayers of the people today. We will be having Holy Communion a little bit later, and we will use these little cups again, these little kits, um, the first part of this, you peel off and you get to the wafer. And if you're having trouble, you can knock this tab down and then it comes up easier. And then the bigger one you pull off to get to the juice. Um, those at home, we encourage you to go ahead and gather your cracker or bread and some uh, water or juice or something to, so that you can participate whenever it comes time uh, for that part later in the service. Again, we're glad that you're here and glad we can be together in worship. Now I invite Tony, who's going to come and lead us in the opening part of our service. For we are weary. We need peace, for our hearts are troubled. We need hope, for we are disappointed. So we come together in this promise that here we can find rest for our souls. Let us pray. Like an oasis in the desert, worship satisfies our thirsty souls. O oh God, we pray that today you would open our hearts to the good in this life. Cause us to delight in your presence and help us to find the hope you have placed deep within the heart of every one of us. Amen. The scripture reading today comes from Psalm 145, verses 8 through 14. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is in an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. So for our children's moment today, I want to, uh, I want, all the adults can listen in, by the way. Um, 
We are, uh, later in the service, I will read a text from Matthew's Gospel where Jesus asked people to come to him and says, come to me because I can give you rest. And then he says, take my yoke upon you. Now, most of us don't deal with yokes much anymore. It is a, <laughs> it is a farm implement, primarily. Uh, it's a, like a piece of wood or metal that stretches across. You can put uh, animals in the harness, and then they can pull together. Often it was used to uh, plow fields. The animals could move forward and, and could work together that way because they were bound together. So it seems a little strange that Jesus would say, take a yoke upon you. It sounds like something we wouldn't want to do. Except that it's giving an idea here, as Jesus always talks about, that we, we are called to follow him, to be his disciple, and that means we pull together and pull together with him. Now, you may wonder why I keep wearing these uh, pieces of cloth around my neck when, when I'm in church, and I keep changing the colors. The colors tend to be very similar, if not match, the colors that are, are in the church up front. We have four basic colors we use. We have this red, we have white, green, and purple. Those represent the seasons of the church year. But the pastor wears a, a, what's called a stole like this. And I was very interested when I learned what the stole represents, one of the things the stole represents. And that is, if you hold this up and look at it, if you know what a yoke looks like, <laughs> it looks pretty similar to a yoke. Now, I wear it like this. But what if you turned it around like this and you put an animal or something in there and then you could steer it with the reins in the back? So one reason that ministers wear this like this is because it represents the yoke of Christ. And so when we are called and ordained into the pastoral ministry, we are uh, called to take on the yoke of Christ. So when I'm wearing this uh, alb or this robe and this stole, that means that it's not just Rod Newman. It is, uh, I am acting on behalf of the church, and I'm acting um, on behalf of Christ. It's a huge responsibility, and one that we are reminded whenever we have this around our neck, the, uh, the importance of it. So there's my white stole. Here is my green stole. I couldn't find my purple stole. It's got to be around here somewhere. This is one that my family gave me a few years ago for Father's Day. And those of you who know me are not surprised to see the Celtic crosses on here. Uh, and they, <clears throat> that represents uh, one of my great loves. So, now you know why we wear these things. And if I look a little weary, you know it's because I've been under the yoke, uh, yoke of Christ. And I think we all, we all can share that burden.
Amen. As you are able, I invite you to stand for the gospel reading. Today from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <clears throat> Jesus seemed to have hit a lull in his ministry. It had all started out so well. His healings and teachings had excited the crowds. People were coming from all over to see him with the hope of getting close enough to have a personal encounter. But when Jesus sent out his disciples to expand the reach of his ministry, they were not as well received as he had been. Before long, his own crowds were not as big either. The enthusiasm not as intense. Maybe the newness had worn off. Maybe the people had started listening a little more closely to his message and heard an edge of danger. That following Jesus may mean trouble from the vested interest of religion, politics, and wealth. The problem started when Jesus shifted his focus and his time from the rural areas to the cities. In the country, people were more accommodating, but expectations were higher in town, where there were more distractions, more people in your business. It didn't help Jesus' mood to get an unsettling message from John the Baptist, his friend and most vocal supporter. John's outspoken criticism of the political authorities had landed him in prison. Now alone and confined, he had plenty of time to reflect on how events had not turned out how he had hoped. He began to question if he might have been mistaken, if God really had called him to be a prophet, or if it was on his own imagination, if Jesus really was the Messiah, or only a sad delusion. Are you the one we've been expecting? That was the word he sent to Jesus. Are you the one we've been expecting? Or do we keep looking for somebody else? This must have felt like an emotional gut punch to Jesus. He and John certainly exhibited different personalities but they had been unified in their message and vision of what God was doing. John was often loud, could be obnoxious, really in your face. He wasn't much on socializing, kept to himself when he wasn't preaching, rarely washed his clothes, and adhered to a strict, if rather unconventional, diet. Jesus enjoyed being around people, all kinds of people. He went where he was invited, and he ate and drank whatever was put in front of him. His words were demanding, but they often came wrapped in stories that entertained as well as challenged. So he told John's messengers, go back and tell John what you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the wretched of the earth 
learn that God is on their side. These are the signs of the kingdom of God breaking in, aren't they? Go tell John, that, and he'll recognize it as what we've been expecting. Well, John might be convinced, but the crowds are still not sure what to make of John or Jesus. These prophets are calling for such a radical change in the way the world works that the lowly would be lifted up, that even those who would benefit by this upending are nervous. If they push too hard, their plight might get even worse. After Jesus finishes addressing the messengers, the crowd breaks up to go home. While walking away, one young woman turns to another. I still think John's crazy. There's just something not right about that man. My grandpa says he has a demon. Yeah, I agree, comes the response. At first it was exciting to hear him speak, but after they locked him up, I'm skeptical. Why is he in jail? The authorities must know something that we don't. Seeking a little diversion, Jesus checks out his Facebook page. A few cat videos would be relaxing, he's thinking. And when he opens his news feed, he sees that he's been tagged in a photo that someone posted from a dinner party he attended a couple of nights ago. Everybody's smiling and laughing, obviously having a good time. There are a few wine glasses on the table, one of which may or may not have been his. And before he can stop himself, he's reading the comments. Looks like you're having a blast, one of his friends posts with a smiley face. I think Jesus is enjoying himself a little bit too much, if you ask me. That's when somebody doesn't even know. And another one, not too picky about who you hang out with, are you, Jesus? Well, that's enough for him. He jumps up and calls to those who are beginning to go home. Is this what you really think of me? You guys are something else. John eats and drinks practically nothing, and you say he's weird. I'll eat whatever I'm served by whoever invites me, and you accuse me of being a booze hound and a moocher. Which is it? You see, apparently people took one aspect of John and one aspect of Jesus and blew them up as if they represented all of who they were. Paint them as extremists. It makes it easier to dismiss them and their message. Maybe that's why Jesus said these folks reminded him of little kids getting together in the backyard on a summer afternoon. Some want to play dress-up, but others think it's silly. That group would rather play a game. But when it looks like they're going to lose, the other kids insist on changing the rules. That's the way it is with your whole generation, Jesus says. And when he says that, he also means it's the way with all generations, including ours. We would rather nitpick the little things so we don't have to deal with the big underlying issues. This generation, like all generations, likes to build up certain charismatic personalities and take the light when they fall. We're so busy defending our own insecurities that we can't seek the common good unless there is a crisis, and sometimes not even then. This is nothing new. But just as the problem is nothing new, neither is the remedy. Just when we half expect Jesus to get fed up and to walk away from the whole mess, he reaches way back into the traditions of the people of God to shine a light on the way forward. Wisdom, Jesus says, wisdom is proven right by her actions. He's recalling what we call the wisdom tradition, found in some Old Testament books like the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Here we find wisdom not just as knowledge gained through experience, but as a clarity of vision and purpose rooted in the love of God and God's intention in the world. It's such a powerful idea 
that it becomes personified as Lady Wisdom, Sophia in Greek. Part of God's very nature, present at the creation, always drawing us to God's way. About 150 years before the birth of Jesus, one of the sages in Jerusalem, a man named Sirach, reminded the people of the importance wisdom provided to the community. He wrote, Come to her with all your soul and keep her ways with all your might. Seek out, search out and seek and she will become known to you. And when you get hold of her, do not let her go. For at last you will find the rest she gives and she will be changed into joy for you. You will wear her like a glorious robe and put her on like a splendid crown. The crown around Jesus that day were familiar with these words. So was Jesus. His ministry was not a fly-by-night operation, not just one of healing and saying nice things. Jesus was the very wisdom of God. Come to me, Jesus says, echoing Lady Wisdom, all of you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, on you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Our salvation will not come from a bunch of know-it-alls, from blindly clinging to the way, th the way things used to be. It will come only when we lay down our burdens and rest in Jesus. When we lay down the need to, to our belief that our worth is determined by what we do. When we lay down the need to keep up appearances. When we lay down the need to always be right. And accept the good news that we are valued simply because we are a child of God. And when we do that, we will relax the grip on our own self-sufficiency. We will encounter wisdom that is deep and abiding, and we can truly give ourselves completely into the arms of God. And when we do that, it will change us. We will be open to a change in the way we see ourselves, the way we see others, the way we see the world, a change that is transformational and healing. Michael Brown tells about a man who was a leader in the congregation he was serving at the time. This man was a model parishioner, an example of all things good and decent and helpful. He gave wise guidance to the church, and he led the congregation with courage and commitment. In conversation one day, Michael was surprised to learn that by his own admission, this man had not always been that way. He said, when I was a young man, I was looking for trouble. And if trouble was really bad, I'd look for it twice. But then he said, I met Elizabeth, a kind, sweet, smiling girl. She loved me even knowing that I wasn't the best person. And little by little, because I wanted to live up to her love, I became less and less a scoundrel. Finally, we married, and I've spent my whole life trying to make her as happy as she made me. And then he said, the truth is, Elizabeth loved me into loving. Come to me, Jesus said. All of you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Letting go of those burdens is not always easy. They're too familiar, too much a part of us, that we can't risk giving them up. It may seem strange that Jesus would then make it more difficult by telling us to take his yoke upon ourselves. A yoke is a symbol of hard labor, of servitude. The irony, of course, is that committing ourselves to the service of Christ is what enables us to live freely and lightly. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Amen.
And now let us pray and up on the screen you'll see the responses at the end of each petition. We gather in this place today, as well as in our homes and cars, thankful for a respite from the summer heat, for we may enjoy the fellowship and support of this community of faith and find nourishment for our souls. By your grace, receive our praise. We come today to seek your blessing for those parts of our spirits that wither in the heat of loneliness and concern about the future, for those whose bodies suffer from illness and abuse, those without the benefit of air conditioning and proper shelter in extreme weather. By your grace, hear our prayer. When we hear Jesus call the weary and heavily burdened, we come running. We're overwhelmed by what we can't understand a virus that causes little problem for some who contact it, but takes the breath and the life of others. Random incidents that can change lives so quickly, mean words spoken with no apparent concern for the hurt they inflict. We yearn for wisdom, but too often what we consider truth tends to be more emotional reactions, biased perceptions, and what we want to hear. By your grace, hear our prayer. Quiet our hearts, redeem our minds, so we can hear your voice above all others and allow its music to be the melody that shapes our steps. Teach us the unforced rhythms of grace. By your grace, hear our prayer. On this weekend, when we remember the founding of our nation, we give thanks for the gifts of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We give thanks for the freedoms we enjoy to worship, to think, and to speak, as well as the freedoms from want and fear. We celebrate the richness of this land, its peaks and valleys, its prairies and rivers, its coast and forest. We give thanks for all who have built its foundations, for servicemen and women who have protected it, for innovators and artists, poets and teachers, farmers and factory workers, all who labor for the common good. We ask your forgiveness when we fail to live up to the ideals we espouse, and your strength and courage and resolve not to rest until they are realized by all people, by your grace. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus who through his death and resurrection made real the possibility of freedom from all that separates us from you and from one another, and pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, today we are grateful that you are here, uh, that you are part of this fellowship. Uh, if this is your first time at Bridgeview, we want to give you a special welcome and hope that you'll come back every time you have the opportunity. You are welcome uh, to be a part of this congregation uh, that we only see a part of today, today but hopefully as the uh, days and months progress, we'll be able to come back in full strength. I know that there are many gifts that all of you offer during the week. I know of your concern and care for each other. I know of the ways that you're looking for ways to serve people in our community and the many prayers that you offer on behalf of the world. And so we want to lift those up today and celebrate those. We also, give, if you'd like to give a financial gift to the church, we're happy to receive that as well. There are ways to give online through Venmo and through the mail. There is also a little box there at the door as you leave. If you'd like to drop an offering in there, you're welcome to do so. And all of it is appreciated. We also have some volunteer opportunities that uh, now that we're getting up and going again, we need some more help with. Um, so, for instance, uh, we need people who are willing to be greeters. And those are people on Sunday morning who stand at the door and in the narthex and greet people as they come in, help answer questions. We also need some folks who are willing to be on a readiness uh, rotation 
and the readiness people come in on Friday or Saturday, whatever you choose, at a time of your choosing, um, prepare the church, make sure everything's ready for church on Sunday, and um, also uh, disinfect and do things like that we have to do in the meantime. Jim is willing to teach anybody that would, is interested, whatever it means to do that. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it's just something that needs to be done. If you're willing to help with that, we need your help. And then the third way is through our technology. Uh, we have some great folks back, back there in the AV booth who are taking care of the technology. Uh, Chuck, without his skills and ability, we wouldn't be on Facebook Live, I'll tell you that. And Terry back there monitoring that, we want to uh, thank, thank them for their service. But we, they need, oh, and, and Nathan, uh, Nathan back there who's making, Nathan's main job is making sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> Uh, making sure my mic is on and that we're we're going and that you have the hardest job Nathan but we appreciate your help too if you are willing to be a part of that AV team uh, we need you to do that uh, to give those folks a break every once in a while if uh, if you're willing and again we will teach you everything you need to know in order to make that happen if you're willing to do any of those things uh, there is a sign up sheet as you leave that you can put your name on there and your uh, contact information if you don't want to sign the sheet or you're still thinking about it, my email address is on there, and you can email me anytime and let me know of your interest, greeters, readiness, and technology. Uh, so in a moment now, we will uh, enter into our service of Holy Communion. Uh, we will have our uh, great Thanksgiving, and then I will invite you when it's time, we will all uh, take the wafer and take the juice together. I want to make sure if you do not have one of these, uh, raise your hand and Jim will bring one to you. One back there, okay, thank you. So and when it's time, I will give you instructions. And again, like I say, you can knock that little tab down and it really helps you find that top one a lot easier. Um, and we'll, this will be the way we're ta we take communion during the time of COVID. So I will move to the table. And shall we pray? It is good and right to praise you, gracious God. For in the beginning, when the world was fresh from your hand, you made us neighbors, one people in many kinds, and lavished on us pleasures too many to name or know. For you, we were a sheer delight for each other, helpers and friends. And so you entrusted to us your justice and your joy but we kept them for a few and denied them to many, creating worlds of poverty and pain, and so broke each other's hearts. But you did not reject us. In the fullness of time, you gave us Jesus, full of grace and truth. By his ministry of mercy, you restored us to each other and to you, mending our hearts and repairing the world. And by his spirit, you impel us even now to be for each other what he is for us, pardon and peace, blessing and delight for all your gifts, we thank you. And now, O oh God, we remember Jesus. We remember that he forgave our sins. He breathed on us the peace of God. We remember that he called us friends. He taught us to love each other as he loved us. We remember that he feasted with the poor and the rich, with strangers and friends. And we remember that on the night in which he gave himself up for us, while at supper with his friends, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, all of you. This is my body given for you. And when the supper was over, he took a cup, gave thanks to you, and shared it with them, saying, Take and drink, all of you. This is the seal of a new covenant, my poured out life. Whenever you do these things, remember me. O oh God, you sent your brooding spirit upon the deep at the dawn of creation, you sent your brooding spirit upon Mary when you came incarnate in Jesus, your word made flesh. You sent your brooding spirit upon the church when you created of us a people devoted to Jesus, to your love in this time and in this place. Send now your spirit on us and on these gifts that we may love as you love and be agents of reconciliation and peace in our broken world. Heal us, empower us, Make us whole. Amen.
the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ given for you. If you will remove the top portion and take out the little wafer. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat with praise and thanksgiving. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink with praise and thanksgiving. And let us pray. For the gift of your son Jesus, for his sacrifice and his love, we give you things that we can participate in that life and in that love. Now we pray that you would empower us, that we can go from this place and continue to share that with a hurting world. Amen. So our invitation to discipleship this week is to listen to Jesus' invitation. To come to him, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and Jesus will give us rest. That invitation is always open. That invitation is there in good times and bad. It is there for us. It is there for the world. And so now let us go in the strength of that spirit. And let us share that good news that Jesus is offering to us all. Amen. Go in peace.